now, Father, we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart will be acceptable in your sight as we open the word today. May someone find Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19, the Bible says, And it came to pass that as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, arise. Go thy way, and thy faith hath made thee whole. Our subject today is, Thou canst make me clean. Of all diseases known in the East, leprosy was the most dreaded. Its incurable and contagious character and its horrible effect upon its victims filled even the bravest with fear. Among the Jews, it was regarded as a judgment on account of sin and hence it was called the stroke or the finger of God. Deep-rooted, eradicable, deadly, it was looked upon as a symbol of sin. By the ritual law, the leper was pronounced unclean. Like one already dead, he was shut out from the habitation of men. Whatever he touched was unclean. The air was polluted by his breath. One who was suspected of having the disease must present himself to the priest who were to examine and decide his case. If pronounced a leper, he was isolated from his family, cut off from the congregation of Israel, doomed to associate with those who were similarly afflicted. The law was inflexible in its requirement. Even kings and rulers were not exempt. A monarch who was attacked by this terrible disease must yield up the scepter and flee from society. Away from his friends and his kindred, a leper must bear the curse of his malady. He was obliged to publish his own calamity, to rend his garments and sound the alarm, warning all to flee from his contaminating presence. The cry, unclean, unclean, coming in mournful tones from the lonely exile was a signal that was heard with fear and abhorrence. In the region of Christ's ministry, there were many of these sufferers, and the news of his work reached them, kindling a gleam of hope. But since the days of Elijah the prophet, no such thing had been known. The poor lepers would have to put a sign on their house declaring that contamin con contagious disease was present. There were 10 men who knew of the stigma. The law in Leviticus provided that a leper had to tear their clothes as a warning to others. They had to shave their heads and put a covering on their upper lip. They were quarantined, excluded from the community. Again and again, they had to cry the mournful call, unclean, unclean. This was the plight of these 10 men outside of a village there near Samaria. There was a Samaritan who waited in this border village for Jesus to pass by on his last journey. Misfortune makes some strange comrades and pulls down many barriers. These lepers may have heard that this man from Nazareth had the power over their disease. He was a work of miracles, so they waited, their hope being fought and disputed by their doubts. As Jesus passed, these lepers cried out in concert their piteous plea and their poignant prayer. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. It's an appropriate cry. For all of us need mercy. Something is out of fix in all of our lives. It is one thing for you and another thing for me, but all of us have something for which we need to cry out to the Lord, Jesus, Master, have mercy. 
The nation ought to lift that cry every morning. There are many noble aspirations and achievements in our American undertaking. These ought to be gratifying to all of us, but we ought not to claim for ourselves unmixed virtue and a history which does not have elements of shame in it. We ought not to rest on the claim that we are better than other nations. The question is whether we are good enough before God. Yes, we all singly and together need to lift that cry, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Each of us needs to cry, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. The cry of these poor lepers attracted and arrested the attention of Jesus. How many times from how many conditions, how many roads had he heard that cry? He said to them, go show yourselves unto the priest. But since the law required that the priest must declare a cure complete, it was a kind of answer to a desperate plea. It was the promise of, God, of Jesus that a miracle would happen and that as they walk by faith, they will be healed by holy power. The Lord is constantly giving us kind answers with great miracles. Had you ever thought that your whole physical well-being depends on some invisible air being silently inhaled and exhaled, a breathing we forget about until under the terrible pressure of some malfunction, we are panting and unable to get that invisible air in our lungs? It's a terrible thing to see such a failure of the miracle. Do you believe in miracles? They are all around us. Your body is an incredible number of cells functioning and irrelated actions. It's a miracle. When a baby is born, it's a miracle. Do you wish to see another miracle? Then look around you. Every day, there are miracles all around you. It's a miracle that any of us are here. We have an enemy who makes it his business to try to destroy us. We have an enemy, if it was up to him, that would take us out while we were yet in our sin. But God is such a loving God that he performs a miracle every day. And every day, with a finger of love, he touches us in the morning. Let's us start on our way. As these teen lepers went, sure enough, the glow of health began to show in skin so long angry and inflamed in disease. They went their way rejoicing, but they forgot who brought health again to their lives. They took the gift, but they forgot the giver. They were sincere in praying, but they were failures in praising. They were even obedient. They went as Jesus told them to do, but they were short in thanking him who blessed their lives. Only one came back to thank Jesus for his great kindness. Thus we come to one of the saddest questions ever to fall from the lips of the Lord while on earth. In his sad question, hurt can be heard, and there breathes a note of disappointment. Anyone who has tried to help and who saw complete indifference or smug acceptance without even a nod of acknowledgement will know something of the Savior's sad question. Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They are summoned to the sound of my voice, who may have asked the Lord to deliver you, and you promised that you would be his, and he would be yours forever if he would only deliver you. And he answered, and now you've gone on as if you never asked. There are some under the sound of my voice who were sick and asked the Lord to please have mercy and put you back on your feet. And he answered your prayer, and you got up, but you walked away without ever a backward glance. Do I speak to somebody who pleaded with the Lord to help with their children? He heard you, and now they're doing well but you've gone on as if you never asked. Where are the young people who've been helped by the church in the name of the Lord? Where are the nine? One, thank God, a Samaritan came back to give thanks. Jesus said to the Samaritan, you can really go your way now. Your faith has made you whole. By inference, the others were sound in body, but in this returning thankful one was made whole, a full person, registered in the divine memory, listed in the Lamb's fair book of life. One cannot help catching in this one Samaritan who returned a certain glad hallelujah, a kind of hurrah for Jesus. What a moment when we know we've laid our burden down. 
And some of you can remember the time when it became clear that the Lord had delivered you. Some of you remember when the Lord delivered you, when he blessed you, when he healed you, when he put you on your feet. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. That's all we can do for the Lord is glorify him. Luther spoke truly when he preached from this text. The right worship of God is to return glorifying God with a loud voice. God stands in need of nothing else. We don't have anything else to give him. The earth is his, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The 50th Psalm tells us that God allows sacrifices like a father receiving a Christmas gift from a child who has nothing on his own. The earth is his, we can't give it to him. The cattle are a thousand hills are his. What we can do is praise him and thank him and glorify him. We can glorify God for the sky over our head. We can glorify God for the earth under our feet. We can glorify God for the heartbeat within us. We can glorify him for the table prepared before us. He is a sun ever shining, a manna ever filling, a father ever giving, a God ever blessing, and a fountain never failing. And God gave us Jesus, and we may be thankful for him who came a long journey looking for us, and who in our lostness finds us, and who in our hunger feeds us, who in our weakness strengthens us, who in our troubles delivers us, who in our sickness heals us, who in our loneliness befriends us, who in our hope confirms us, and who in our dying saves us. Praise God for Jesus. Praise God for Jesus. Praise God for Jesus. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. It is because of God's love through his son Jesus the Christ that any of us has any hope of eternal life. That gift of eternal life is yours. You just have to accept it. We want to thank you for spending this time with us. And we ask that if you were impressed to give your heart to Jesus, that you would at your earliest convenience send a note to the following address. Ephesus SDA Church, P.O. Box 201-119, San Antonio, Texas. You may return your tithe and offering to www.adventistgiving.org or you can mail it to the address that we just gave you, which is Ephesus SDA Church, P.O. Box 201-119. San Antonio, Texas, 78220. Again, may God richly bless you. We'll see you next week. Be looking on your email, your telephone line. There will be a prayer line beginning this Wednesday. That you can call in and we'll all pray together. God bless you until next week.